Hi, it's me, Jazzy. I'm back with another tech-related video, and today I'm taking a look at an oscilloscope. It's an old-school analog oscilloscope. I picked it up a while ago on eBay and haven't got around to taking a look at it. So let's take a look at what we got here. What's a bit odd about this is they've sent it in the oscilloscope bag. This, it came with its original bag, and rather than putting it in a box, they've just sent it in the bag. So I'm kind of hoping it's all right. It should be, if it's in one piece, a Farnell 60 meg scope. Now, nothing unusual about that. I love a bit of Farnell gear, as you know. What makes this special is I paid, and I kid you not, 11 pounds, about seven pounds for shipping, seven pounds something. But yes, 11 pounds. I think it's come from a clearance or something because the description basically said, when they plug it in, a light comes on, they know nothing else about it. So it does at least power up. Let's get it over on the bench and see if it's still in one piece. Okay, well, it's fairly heavy, as you'd expect. But why on earth they sent it in the bag? I get that that's convenient, but like, how protective is this? I'm a little concerned about this one. Right, let's have a, let's have a look then. What's the damage? It's a real shame because now there's tape residue all over the bag. What a shame. So also quite a lot of damage and scuffs to the bag that weren't in the listing. So I'm guessing the stuff's just, so hopefully all intact, right? So we've got a Farnell scope probe here and um, we've got some fuses and stuff in there. Looks like maybe the original accessory pack. It, like it had all the original stuff. Oh yeah, that's um, quite damaged. Yeah, it takes more than a bag to protect stuff from the post, which is why I'm incredibly worried about this. So I'm a little bit nervous about opening this. Look at this. Well, here's the scope. I mean, the front panel looks to be okay. Oh, so we've got our book. At least that's intact. Let's have a look. Condition. So, all right. Thankfully, everything seems to have survived. The top of the bag was quite padded and multi-layered because quite often you find these get damaged on scopes and they end up at all weird angles and stuff. But thankfully there doesn't appear to be any real damage. There doesn't seem to be any damage to the bottom of the casing or the top. Even the handle still looks all right. Yeah. Nothing really bad, but let's have a look around the back. I'd say we got away with that. That actually survived the postal system <laughs> in just its bag. Which courier did this come from? Every. All right, shout out to every for getting this here in one piece. Shame about all the tape on the bag. I think we should maybe get the cover off of this before I try and power it up, as it's had quite an arduous journey. I actually got away with quite a lot there because all of this could have been subjected to damage in the post. We've got to see if there's anything been dislodged internally though, because I bet this was subjected to a lot of shake, rattle and roll. So what we've basically got is a 60 meg, two channel scope with an external input as well. So that's quite nice. So you can display an external input. So we've got delay time on here. We've got sweep mode. So it's got quite a lot going for it. Two internal channels and one external. So you could put an external signal into this on channel three. That's quite nice. Here's the other Farnell scope that I've got. I've had this hanging around here for a very, very, very long time. I thought it was a DTV40. It's not. It's a DTV20. It's a 20 meg scope. But look how yellow this one is in comparison to this one. You can see now why I was drawn to this because it is pretty much its original colour, which I guess is like beige. I don't even know if this one works. This is one I've had... I picked it up yonks ago and it's been in storage and I've never got around to actually looking at it. 
I might get round to it one day. If I can get this one up and running, it might spur me on to do this one. This has got a component tester on it. Yeah, definitely not as nice condition as this, but good comparison. What I will note is though, the 20 meg scope is a lot lighter than this one. I guess all those extra megs, they weigh quite a bit, right? What's the uh, conversion of megs to kilos? Anyone know? All right, so what I'd like to do before I attempt to even power this up is I wanna have a look inside and see if anything has become dislodged or damaged. And also, cause I don't know the history of this, I just wanna see if there's anything that looks burnt or likely to cause me a problem. I believe there's somebody quite famous that always says, don't turn it on, take it apart. So let's do that. Because if I turn it on and it goes bang, I will regret it. Having managed to get the thing here in one piece. Right, so the only casualty really was the plug. I had visions of it being much worse. Let's just get the top cover off first and we'll see what's what. That feels like it's gonna come off now. Yep, there we go. Nice. All right, what do we have? Nothing looks damaged, dislodged. It doesn't rattle. It passes the rattle test. There's no bits rattling around inside it. I'm looking for any obvious signs of damage. This is slightly out of shape here. But nothing looks to have impacted on this. Thankfully, how we got away with that? Well, I say that. <laughs> is it going to power on? Well, I'm not seeing anything from a visual inspection. I'm not seeing anything that looks black, burnt. There's no weird stains or smells or anything emanating from this. I really don't think the scopes had much use, you know? Now it was shown powered up in the listing, but there was no trace on the screen. There is a tantalum down there. You can see it, dark blue one. Looks a little bit discolored. It's worth investigating. Just under the secondary, you can see it. Looks like no voltage regulators. It's all transistors by the look of it. Yeah, it is. Not seeing anything obvious. None of the caps seem to be bulging. I think I'm going to replace that tantalum anyway. I'm getting uh, 1.001 microfarads. Okay. Now I have got a replacement here, but it does look much the same. It's just, I think some of it's where the light's hitting it. You've always got the markings on the front there and the light's hitting it, making it look like the tantalum's discoloured. It's reading okay, surprisingly. Let's check. I want to check that electrolytic at the back there before I power this up. Can I even get in there? Right, I can't quite get in there with the tweezers, so I'm gonna have to use the M162. I need to be in capacitance mode, that would help. All right, because I'm right up close against this edge, I can't get the tweezers in at the angle that I want to, so I'm gonna use the M162 for this with the Kelvin probes. If I've got to replace any of these caps, this board's gonna have to come out. 44 microfarads, 1.74 ohms, ESR, Right, what well, should it be? Right, according to the schematic, that should be 47 microfarads, so that's reasonably okay. All right, 1.018 ohms. I'm just gonna check nothing's likely to be short before I power this thing up. It's quite hard getting down in here. Now, this is where we need a talking LCR meter. I'm looking at 76.48 ohms. All right, let's give me 85.97 ohms. I mean, that, that tantalum checks out okay. I'm probably gonna replace it anyway for peace of mind. Well, I can't see any obvious shorts. I can't see any obvious burnt components. So in the usual spirit of things, I'm gonna go ahead and power it up and see what it does. It was shown switched on in the eBay listing. Uh, it wasn't showing a trace. So whether it's just that it wasn't set up right or, here we go. Okay, power on. Ooh. No smoke, no nasty noises. Yeah, we've got some, some signs of life. And there's 
grass cure illumination works nicely. Well, okay, goes pretty bright. Ah, oh, there we go. Trace rotation is a little bit wonky. Or is that my eyesight? Oh no, it's alright. Oh, it's a little bit, tiny little bit maybe. It's alright. How are we doing heat wise? Can't smell anything. Obviously I haven't checked voltages or anything yet. Look at that. Something is getting quite hot. Yeah, there's a couple of resistors that are getting pretty hot there. You're going to need to check the voltages on this to make sure everything's okay. See, that resistor is not... See, we're getting 30 on that. Yeah, because they're right under the heat sink. See, yeah, the stuff around the heat sink's getting hot. It's going to, isn't it? <laughs> the way they've stuffed some of these caps under the heat sink. Nothing else there appears to be getting mad hot. Alright, let's power off for a minute. I think we need to check some voltages. Make sure I'm happy with this before we do anything else with it. Well, yeah, maybe I can. Right, there's the minus 12, great. There's a the plus 12. We've got minus 12, we've got plus 12. And the plus 5 was 5.1 volts. So just checking the positive end of the bridge rectifier for the 145 volt is going to be there. Yeah, 143.5. Voltage rails check out okay. 145 volts plus 12 minus 12. We've got our 5 volt for the logic. So it's all looking good. Nothing's getting over hot apart from the heat sinks. Obviously there's multiple ways of testing with thermal cameras and stuff. The most important thing is when you're setting up your thermal cameras is to set your emissivity right because sometimes you can get false readings if you're on the wrong emissivity and also you can get reflection off of things like aluminium heat sinks because this area was an area of high heat here obviously it would be but these resistors were appearing to be hotter than they actually were. Now I could confirm that with just a regular thermometer. And of course, once the device is powered down, extremely carefully putting your finger on components to see if anything is still warm or not. Obviously, you want to keep away from any high voltage areas. I'm happy enough with this now to have it powered up for an extended amount of time to see which functions on it work and which functions don't. So we know it powers up okay, and we know that we do get a trace off it. So let's find a probe. Let me see if I can get a... Well, we've got something going on there. The trigger's obviously not quite right. Right, there we go. Okay, not too bad. It's a reasonable square wave. So it's got quite a lot going for it, this scope. I've not used one of these before. The other Farnell that I've got, I've been, I've had it hanging around for a while, but I've never actually fully investigated it. I've got a queue of things waiting for me to tinker with them. Let's try the other channel then before we celebrate too much. Let's go channel two. Channel two. Channel two is not looking quite so nice. I wonder if it's this. It's not a nice square, is it? Like it was on channel one. I'm going to give everything a good clean. I feel like these connections are just a little bit iffy. So good old go with some IPA to get the grime off. Often does the trick. I knew these brushes would come in handy. Turn that one off so I don't get confused. Right, okay now Channel 2, it doesn't seem to be quite as clean a wave, does it? So, seeing as we had a lovely square wave on channel 1, but not on channel 2, my best guess is it could be the input capacitance needs adjusting. Now, fortunately, I do have the calibration instructions here. So, all we have to do is adjust these trimmers for channel 2, which is VC103 and VC106. So to access these trimmers, you need to get at them from the bottom because they're tucked inside a bunch of stuff. And um, what we want is VC103 and VC106. 
We've got our little map here. So VC103 is going to be here and 106 is here. So those are the two. We still got our rounded edges here, so that is what we need to adjust. So one of those two trimmers will hopefully do what we need. It's not perfect, but it's better. Well, there you go. I've been fiddling around with it for a while and that's about as good as I can get it. It's not bad. It's better than it was. Right, so let's try channel one, sine wave. Yeah, that looks nice. Trace is nice. Doesn't look as good on camera. When you bring that into focus, that looks actually really nice trace. Got to be happy with that. Okay, channel two. There we go. We've got channel two. And of course we've got external input channel three. You can have three at once, look at that. And we have to trigger that externally. There you go. There we go. You've got three things going on at once there. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Plus you've got the delay as well. Well, I reckon we've got a bit of a bargain scope there. Fantastic. Right, let's get the lid on. Well, there you go. We seem to have pretty much a working Farnell DTV60. It was quite the job trying to get all the screws back in because the case seems to have become ever so slightly misaligned because it was so badly packed in transit. It's a testament to the fact that it's a pretty robust scope that it has survived so well and is fully working. I'm just glad none of the front panel got damaged. So there you go. The moral of the story is if you're shipping stuff, put proper packaging on it, please. So if you're just getting started in electronics or you've not used an oscilloscope before, you can pick up some real bargain cheap analog scopes out there on eBay, but just be aware that they are clocking on a bit and they might need a bit of love and at least a bit of preventative maintenance. There's more I can do with this one. I'm definitely going to replace that tantalum and probably some of the electrolytics, if not all of them, to give it a long and happy life. So we touched briefly on adjusting the input capacitance and there are obviously many things you can adjust and calibrate on a scope like this. Now I will be taking a look in a future episode at some point down the line at scope calibration. I've got this Bradley unit here which is a type 192 scope calibrator and once I've done a little bit of an overhaul and maintenance on that then we can try it out on some of the analog scopes that I've got here. So it's all good common sense stuff that you can do. Once you acquire an old bit of test gear, rather than just plugging it straight in, just give it a once over. Look for anything, do a visual inspection, check the voltage rails, check the caps, check for any shorts, that sort of thing. Anything obvious before you power it up. And then it gives your device a much better chance. So I hope you've enjoyed today's video, taking a look at this bargain Farnell oscilloscope. Big thanks to everyone for watching, sharing and subscribing. If you'd like to go ahead and hit the subscribe button, it's always massively appreciated and helps to support the channel. I'll be back soon with some more tech related videos, but in the meantime, take care and I'll see you on the next one.